Hello, my name is Henry Pearson, and uh, the book I chose to review is called A Perfect Threat, uh, Population Growth, Climate Change, and Natural Resource Depletion in the 21st Century by Craig R. Smith. Um, the book was uh, published in 2021 by Amgen Publishing, LLC. Um, the book consists of seven chapters and uh, primarily focuses on uh, just what uh, Craig R. Smith considers the perfect threat, which is a combination of of a couple different factors that amount to the kind of the, the population climate change scare. And he he focuses on this in terms of a 50 to 100 year future. So in the next 50 to 100 years, he focuses on these factors and kind of break down what he considers the perfect threat. And uh, and later on in chapter six and seven, he uh, brings forth some some solutions and conclusions. Um, so I just I decided to break this book down chapter by chapter. Uh, so chapter one, um, it's it's a shorter chapter, and it focuses on like setting the stage for the rest of the book, uh, primarily just discussing the issue and what the issue is. Um, some main points from this chapter. Um, humans may be threatened by their own existence in the next 50 to 100 years. Um, it is stated that there is a uh, political force, as uh, Craig, Craig R. Smith believes that um, both Republicans and Democrats with the same type of scientific knowledge in regards to the environment, climate, population, etc. Um, 70% of uh, Democrats seem to believe that humans are the driving force behind climate change and only 21% of Republicans. Um, Craig R. Smith addresses the opposition of climate of the climate argument by stating um, any individual that kind of dim- dismisses rising temperatures um, kind of just, they dismiss it with the, um, the precursor that it's just a climate that naturally cycles and he just states that these people do exist. Um, just kind of sets up the opposition in that regard. Um, um, one of the main points from this first chapter is that uh, humans respond best to threats that are uh, immediate, sudden, immoral, or personal. So, um, and we kind of know that like a, like a climate threat is not one of those threats. I mean, 50 or 100 years is um, 100, it, it's not immediate, it's not sudden. Um, it may be immoral, but the issue here is that we'll find with the further chapters is that, um, so like a lot of people just don't understand it. They don't understand what the perfect threat is and personal, it can be personal, but in many cases it is not. Um, so that, that's basically chapter one, just kind of setting the stage. Um, so, uh, chapter two, chapter two mainly focuses on, um, the basics of human population growth and explains the dynamics and why it can be an issue. Um, so Craig's, uh, Craig R. Smith uh, opens up this chapter by stating that the world population is increasing in rapid numbers due to advancements made in human, uh, largely ma- uh, due to inv- advancements made in human reproductive process. Uh, he stated that somewhere along the line, women were, I guess, through evolution or Probably not evolution because that takes a while, but I guess just through process and just technological advancements and just kind of doing things better, women were able to, uh, women can now get pregnant like um, throughout the whole year rather than just in estrus cycles. And um, they can get pregnant fairly quickly after giving birth, um, which he states amounts for the um, rapid numbers. Um, one of the, uh, well, I should say this book consisted of a lot of statistics. Um, I definitely found a lot of them interesting, but I kind of picked through them and found the ones that I, like I thought were the most impactful. And one of them from chapter two was that in the year zero, the world had 190 million people. And in 2000 years, so year 2000, uh, we increased our population to 9.8 billion, which, I mean, 2000 years, like obviously we're going to grow. But the crazy thing here is that from 10,000 BCE to the year zero, which is 10,000 years, we went from 4 million people to 190 million. So the, the gap there is, it's crazy. I mean, 
we're talking about 4 million plus 186 to 190 million from 190 million people to 7.8 billion, which is just insane. So there's clearly some something going on, right? Um, Craig talks a little bit about demography, which is like the study of human populations. Um, talks about types of periodic censuses and how we uh, get these statistics. Uh, he talks about how age, gender, place of residence, educational level, uh, occupation, religion, citizenship, place of origin, and language spoken are all things taken into account in a periodic census for population. And this is how we know things about our Earth's population. And that basically concludes chapter two. Um, then we go on to chapter three. Chapter three uh, mainly primarily focuses on the uh, sources of climate data and the uncertainty surrounding climate sensitivity. Um, one of the interesting things I found from this chapter was uh, Craig talks a lot about how humans as a species are said to be the most adaptive of any other species. We're, we're able to adapt to weather using technology. Like we obviously are the smartest so we can get around things. Um, but he says, despite our ability to adapt to weather, it is an issue and it is a threat to us because we look at history, certain wars have been affected by weather, wars have been won or lost. We've seen entire civilizations crushed by floods, droughts. I mean, you, you see weather everywhere and it, it, it's an issue. And like, I think there's a misconception that humans think we can, we can figure our way out of everything, which is, I mean, we can in a sense, at least issues that we have now on earth. I don't know about the future, but, um, but like we actually have to do something about this. It's not just gonna, like, we can't just like sit back and just hope. Um, Craig talks a little bit about the science, um, the Milankovic effect, which is earth's movement around the sun is not perfectly circular. Uh, earth's albedo, earth's surface and atmosphere reflect some, reflect some of the incoming solar radiation back into space. He talks about atmospheric absorption and greenhouse effect um, and how we receive uh, radiation from the sun and the greenhouse effect keeps it in. Um, and mainly just like chapter three just kind of talks more about the science and how the globe can be heated and just like how climate is affected. And he talks about what climate is, which we know is like the long term effect, like the long term uh, weather. It's not just the daily weather. Um, but now we go on to chapter four. Chapter four uh, discusses the movement of resources, non-renewable, renewable, and perpetual. Um, chapter four talks about how the majority of energy consumption today today comes from fossil fuels, which is an issue. Um, we talk about the ideal energy source in this chapter and how the ideal energy source is one that is inexpensive, safe, reliable, and has a positive net energy yield. For example, nuclear energy has a slight negative net energy yield, is extremely expensive, very reliable, but it, it can be said to not be safe. I mean, when done right, it is safe, but um, that's just an example. Um, uh, he said, uh, Craig states that the um, world energy consumption is primarily driven by population growth, which kind of just makes sense. Um, and that four countries, China, US, India, Russia, uh, make up 55% uh, of the world's energy consumption and consist of 42% of the world's population. So that was an interesting uh, statistic. And that energy consumption seems to grow around 1.7% each year, which will be an issue in the 50 to 100 time period span of years that Craig is looking into. Talks a little bit about wind, solar, nuclear, geothermal, just some alternate energy sources. Um, talks about the pros and cons of these. For uh, time purposes, I, I'm not really going to be able to get into all of those, but um, he talks a little bit about agricultural land, arable land, um, permanent cropland, permanent pastures, um, and how deforestation can create more of these. Um, he says 320 million acres of forest have been converted into, converted into agricultural land, which is unreal. I mean, I, it's hard to even imagine what 320 million of anything looks like, but... I thought that was crazy. Um, then we move on to chapter five. Chapter five talks about the geographic distribution of population growth, climate change, and natural resource depletion. Um, it's kind of a shorter chapter as well, but it, it mainly focuses on 
this is where you, Craig kind of gets into the individual countries, which personally, I did not like this part of the book as much as the previous four chapters. Um, I don't know. It wasn't my favorite part. I mean, it got into the individual comfort, uh, countries. I thought it just got a little too long. I mean, he listed like 10 countries. I mean, so you got some namely ones like the United States, India, China, um, Russia, hugely populated countries. So obviously they're going to be on there. Um, and just some other ones. And he just went super in depth on to, into how they affect the global atmosphere in terms of carbon emissions, population growth, that type of thing. Um, I, it was, it just, this part was tough to get through because it was kind of the same factors being analyzed in each country, but it was just a different country, obviously. So it, it just, it, I did not like chapter five as much. Um, chapter six, I did enjoy because this is where Craig R. Smith finally gets to some solutions. Um, which is good to hear because the uh, previous chapters are basically, they're really pessimistic, so it's kind of nice to hear some solutions. So chapter six discusses ways to create a more sustainable world by the end of the century. It builds on previous chapters and, con and uh, consolidates all that information uh, into solutions for moving forward. Craig, uh, Craig R. Smith states three goals. First goal is that we must uh, accelerate the current decline in population growth. Our rate for countries where the growth rate exceeds the replacement rate. So, and his main solution is that um, we need to change cultural norms. And um, he says urbanization can help that. And he also suggests something that I thought was really interesting. Um, late marriage, as in marriage by the age of 25 years old. Um, and then he moves forward to his second goal. Second goal is that we must eliminate the global net increase in uh, atmospheric carbon emissions. This one I thought was kind of a no-brainer, but, you know, greenhouse, uh, he states that greenhouse gas emissions need to be reduced uh, by uh, decreasing the use of coal, increasing the use of wind, geothermal, and solar power, increasing the use of nu uh, nuclear power, and uh, increasing the use of existing technologies such as electric cars. Again, these all seem kind of um, obvious to me. Um, he states that China and India need to do a better job of reducing carbon emissions. And what opened my eyes to this is that when you look at the statistics from 2008 to 2019, China and India were able to reduce their carbon emissions by 50%. But even in doing that, they were still double what the United States and all of the Europe zone, as he states, the Eurozone, China and India were still double those two countries. So... They definitely need to do a better job of that in the grand scheme of the world. Um, and the third goal is to increase investment in new technology and improve existing technology. That one's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, and then we move into chapter seven, the final chapter. Uh, chapter seven focuses on summarizing the book and talks about changing course in regards to Earth's status. It's kind of just a um, extension of chapter six, in my opinion. Um, he, Craig R. Smith does address why there is such a slowed progress of um, making the world more sustainable. Um, he says straight up, it's because the public's perception is not quite the, like at the level of science. I mean, just the grand scheme of the world doesn't understand what, uh, what the perfect threat is. So he states that's kind of one of the reasons. Um, but he says that we do know what works and what doesn't work, and we know how to fix it. We just do not have, we just do not have the support yet. So maybe it's just a good leader is what we need. Who knows? But he does. He just states that we know, like we have prior failures. We know what doesn't work, and we have the solutions. Um. So yeah, I mean, I thought the book was quite interesting. It definitely relates to what we're doing in class. I think the main objective was probably just to spread awareness. I mean, when he talks about in chapter seven about how. A lot of the world does not know what the perfect threat is. I think he's just really trying to spread awareness. Um, and uh, I think this was, I think he was successful in this. But I will say, I don't think this is something that has not been tried before. I think, I mean, 
you go everywhere about in the world and you will see things about like, you know, we got to be more sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. But um, like he said earlier in chapter one, humans respond to things that are immediate. So maybe it just takes some, uh, some like maybe some government funding to try to persuade anything like that. But um, what worked and what didn't work in this book, I, I really enjoyed the um, first four or five chapters when it talked about mainly the science and kind of set up, but I didn't enjoy or first four chapters. I didn't enjoy chapter five as much where it dove into these specific countries. That wasn't as interesting to me, but maybe for someone else, you know, major themes of the book. Um, really just that like our time is running out. Craig, Craig thinks that, uh, in the next 50 to 100 years, we're going to have real issues and that we need to kind of band together as a human race to, um, you know, really like fix our earth to be more sustainable so that we can live more, uh, live, live longer on this earth and that, um, we need to reduce the population in a sense. Um, I suppose the intended audience for this book was really anyone. I mean, if you knew a bunch, if you're an environmental scientist and you know a bunch about this stuff, I'm sure this is a good read as a peer. And, um, if you know nothing about it, it's even better because it's good to know. Um, the author definitely, uh, reinforced and added to ideas I had. It didn't as much change any of my perceptions, but this book definitely added to my perception of a sustainability, a sustainable earth and, um, reinforced a lot of my thoughts in terms of like carbon emissions. Like we all know kind of carbon, like coal is bad. Like we know that definitely reinforced that type of thing, but, um, and what I recommend this book to others, I would say it depends on how motivated you are to read the book and how interested you are in the topic. I think it's it can be a tough read because a lot of the pages have to do with statistics and numbers. It can be it can be rough to get through. But I think if you're if you're truly interested in the topic, um, I think it could be a really good read. I just and it's only like from chapter one to chapter seven, it's two hundred five pages. And the book in total is like 233. So it's not that long of a read. It's definitely manageable. And um, I suppose I'd recommend it, but it just depends on the person. Um, and yeah, so that is, um, that is a perfect threat by Craig R. Smith. Thank you.